Matthew's Message, February 3, 2014. With loving greetings from all souls at the station, this is Matthew. The outpouring of gratitude for the Apostle Matthew message was cause for celebration here. Always we honor souls' divine right to believe as they wish, and we are elated when the choice is to embrace truths put forth. Far more than our repeated assurance that you know at soul level what is true and what is not, your personal experiences are irrefutable evidence that your soul's knowledge is reaching your conscious awareness. Even more so than last year, Earth's first year of freedom from the shroud of darkness, energy incoming and generated on the planet during this year will produce light in such abundance that souls can vault in conscious and spiritual growth, with exponential effects throughout your world. As light increases, so do the vibratory levels throughout your mineral, plant and animal kingdoms. The consciousness of every form on the planet can expand as Earth's ascension continues, only her human residents have the choice to flow without stirring upliftment or resist. Divisiveness over the most serious issues affecting your society will continue until the light becomes so strong that extreme stances no longer can deter constructive steps toward peaceful resolution. Rational discussions underway and those that will begin may bog down from time to time, but overall they will gain momentum. And what you call common sense, which still is not common to all, eventually will emerge in situations that in this moment are static or volatile. There is a great deal of talk about fear of terrorism in connection with the Winter Olympic Games in Sochi, and it is needless, always fear not only is needless, it is counterproductive because it creates negativity for Earth to deal with. Universal family and ships and on the ground are in constant communication about active and potential hot spots, and in accordance with Gaia's wishes, they are authorized to prevent serious terrorist attempts. If any small-scale efforts result in injury or death, just as in all other such cases, they would be a matter of contract provisions of the souls involved. Also we want to ease your minds about the situation at the Fukushima nuclear power facility. The technology aboard spacecraft surrounding the planet is diluting the toxicity in radioactive soil and water, and the diligent crews are doing everything possible to prevent further damage to the deteriorating reactors. What is happening at that facility is a persuasive reason to end that source of energy everywhere on the planet, and you can greatly aid Earth in her healing process by moving away from nuclear power and fossil fuels and advancing toward renewable and free energy sources. Unusual storms, record-breaking high and low temperatures, flooding, drought, wildfires, earthquakes and volcanic eruptions are cleansing Earth's interior, surface and atmosphere and they are leading to a moderate climate globally. We also have been asked to comment on two large spots on the moon. Actually, nothing is on Luna, those are shadow images of large ships, which may vanish and reappear to show the mobility, convincing Earth's peoples not only that other civilizations are nearby, but they are there for peaceful purposes which must be an orientation process to prevent mass fear and psychic shock. Now then, Last month's message evoked far more responses and questions than any other message during the 10 years they have been available, and it is appropriate that now I speak for myself only. First, I thank you on behalf of my mother, this is the first time readers have sent only positive reactions, not even one has been mean-spirited. I am eager to begin addressing questions because the answers will offer a great deal of insight into your lives and life in this universe. So many of you asked questions about my biblical lifetime or related topics, which you shall see pertain to everyone, so some will be included here and the rest in the next message. If there was no Last Supper, what is the Holy Grail? The Last Supper story inspired individuals to seek the chalice that had held the blood of Jesus, an object considered to be the most sacred and with the most power of anything on earth. There never was any such object but indeed there is something sacred that is more powerful than anything else on earth. The Holy Grail is the soul. Nothing in this universe is more powerful than the love light energy of souls. I never believed Jesus was going to return as the same person he was 2000 years ago, but has he reincarnated on earth? No, but the love light essence of Jesus always is on earth and everywhere else in this universe. 
because the timeless continuum, where multiple multidimensional lifetimes are happening simultaneously and everything affects everything else, is a nebulous concept almost impossible to grasp. Reincarnation is the closest that messengers from the light could describe a process that fits into your linear time frame. But it is not that Albert Einstein, say, reincarnates as this or that person, and I'll do my best to explain the reality. Every one of the countless souls throughout the cosmos is a unique, independent, inviolate eternal being. At the same time, it is energetically interconnected with all others. The beginning of every soul was the instant creator let burst forth its love light self, the Big Bang, and everything in existence is co-created by souls using creator's energy to put their ideas into motion and form. Soul A, let us say, wants to incarnate for the first time. After putting its ideas into a soul contract, it enters into an agreement, we call it pre-birth agreement, with other souls that want to share the lifetime. Then it designs and co-creates a body for its personage that fits what it wants to experience as a mortal. Thereupon soul A becomes a cumulative soul while remaining its unique eternal self, and it shares all of its knowledge with the soul of the new personage. The term cumulative is applied to soul A because it initiated the physical lifetime of another soul, but as you shall see, that is the start of cumulative experiencing. Let us call that first personage soul B. All of Soul B's characteristics endowed by Soul A and all experiences throughout the lifetime. Intelligence, talents, body form and features, personality, ideas, relationships, education, habits, plans, accomplishments, disappointments, heartaches, joys, doubts, failures, interests, fears, are added to Soul A's database as Soul B has each experience, and everything is retained by Soul B when its body dies. When Soul A wants to embark upon a different kind of physical life, it goes through the same process. Now it has not only its original knowledge, but also the lifetime experiencing of Soul B to share with its second personage. When Soul B wants to put into motion its own ideas, it makes a soul contract and so forth. Like Soul A, it remains a unique soul self while sharing its knowledge, from personal experiencing and that which was endowed by Soul A with the soul of its first personage. Soul A and Soul B grow in experience, knowledge and wisdom with each of their personages, each of whom is a unique, independent, inviolate eternal soul. And the composite is a force field of diverse, interconnected lifetimes that grows with new personages wherever they are throughout the universe. Souls choose contract provisions to fill gaps or strengthen areas of cumulative experiencing to balance all of the lifetimes. Thus, an ever-expanding storehouse of awareness is available to all souls in the lineage. Evolvement comes as personages consciously tap into that storehouse, so it's not learning anew, but rather a process of self-discovery, remembering what is known at soul level from the beginning. And, just as you are living in this moment, so are all the beings you think of as your past or future lives. You and all of those other unique souls are living in the now of the continuum. From my lifetimes in third density civilizations, I know how difficult it is trying to understand something for which there is no conscious frame of reference, and my explanation may have added confusion rather than clarification about multiple multidimensional lifetimes. So, please know that everything I described happens simply and divinely, as someday you shall see for yourselves, again. If the crucifixion and resurrection did not happen, what was the nature of the encounter with Jesus that made his followers disseminate his teachings so fearlessly and enthusiastically? I can speak with certainty only for myself. Never was any fear involved, but indeed enthusiasm was, because I knew in my heart that Jesus always spoke the truth and did so lovingly. And as I mentioned in my last message, I had ample opportunity to tell people about his teachings. However, from what I've learned, Remembered, since my lifetime in biblical days, the Catholic Church's relentless emphasis on their version of Jesus' life, death and resurrection is the reason Christianity spread far and wide. Can you explain why some channels say the crucifixion did happen and others say it didn't? I can offer possible reasons for the discrepancy, 
and one is that a crucifixion took place in a parallel world. Individuals put forth energy into the directions they are considering taking, and when they reach the point of having to decide, the conscious selves proceed in the chosen direction. But the strong energy invested in the path not taken can't be stopped, it continues to flow in its direction and along the way manifests logical situations in accordance with what the individuals had been contemplating prior to decision making. In the case of the crucifixion, as Jesus' followers kept increasing in numbers, the leaders of state and church became more and more concerned that his teachings were threatening their hold on the populace. Some of the leaders favored ordering Jesus out of the country rather than risk making him a martyr by putting him to death, and others wanted to kill him. Thus energy was put forth in both directions and the energy focused on crucifixion proceeded to that outcome in a parallel world. Since those worlds exist in the continuum just as worlds do where factual events occur and there are no labels that distinguish one from the other, some sources of transmitted information may be reporting events in a parallel world. Another possibility is that a hologram of the crucifixion and resurrection, perhaps designed by Jesus and Mary or others closest to them, was displayed on earth. That cruel form of punishment satisfied the bloodthirstiness of many living in those times and the resurrection gave hope to those who thirsted for relief from life's harshness. Still another possibility has to do with the power of the mind. If channels, receivers is more accurate because all of you are channels of energy, unwaveringly believe that the crucifixion and resurrection occurred, their beliefs can override information in the transmissions they receive. The power of the mind affects every circumstance in one's life, what a person believes is her or his reality, however far removed that may be from the facts. You said that when you were Matthew the Apostle you didn't consciously know the other things you wrote about in that message. Why didn't you? How did you find out about them? Let us compare what I consciously knew in that lifetime with all the memories in your brain's memory bank. If all of those memories flooded into your mind simultaneously, it would be overwhelming. It would be the same if the combined knowledge of all my personages had flooded into my consciousness then. I, we, have a growing reference library, you could say, where all of the information is available whenever we choose to go there. Exercising that choice is the self-discovery I mentioned, remembering what the soul knows. And because each discovery comes with such a powerful sense of rightness without even a shred of doubt, you know with your entire being that it's indisputably true. Although it is the very same with every person, at soul level, everyone has full knowledge from the beginning, remembering comes more easily to people in advanced civilizations and in spirit worlds, where bodies are not encumbered by the density of lower vibrations. Especially in a civilization with third density consciousness, a body's density blocks awareness of what the soul knows. Do you speak for souls at that station because they're your personages? Some of the many millions of souls here are my personages, but most are not. Our link to this station is Evolvement Status. A few years ago I spoke about this in a message. Station as we use it is not related to any specific place or civilization, but rather as the level of spiritual growth a soul has attained regardless of its universal origin and number of experiencing lifetimes. When I speak of souls at this station, I refer to a peer group whose spiritual clarity has evolved into attunement with the unconditional love and awareness of the oneness of all. This could be called group mind or collective souls because of the shared enlightenment. But in a larger sense, it is a melding of innumerable personage soul selves into one higher soul. January 19th to 20th, 2009 Appointment may not be the right word for how you became spokesperson for the other souls where you are, but how did you get that position? If another soul there were spokesperson, would their information be exactly the same as yours? Choice is more correct than appointment. And it isn't by voting for candidates, but rather a unanimous thought that specific souls can best express certain aspects of the group knowledge. I am not the only one who speaks for all of us. It is only to my mother that I transmit messages for this group, others send information to their respective receivers. Only truth exists at this level, so never is there disagreement about what any of us transmits. However, 
we don't send exactly the same information. It is a matter of differences in our collective experiencing. For instance, many of Cryon's personages have extensive scientific expertise universally that many other souls' personages, including mine, have to a lesser extent. Another factor is our receiver's vocabularies. My mother has no education in the sciences, so she doesn't know the words I would need to speak about matters of that nature. Did other souls where you are now know you when you were Matthew the Apostle, or don't you know each other's personages? We know about each other's personages who are well known on a universal scale, and that is relatively few. Collectively our personages are in numbers you cannot imagine, many in forms and appearances, including animals, which to your conscious mind are equally unimaginable. Some souls here had personages who lived during that time in your history, but they would have known me then only if our lives were closely connected. My valued friendship with Jesus and my satisfying experience as a teacher made my life as Matthew very gratifying, but in context of the countless numbers of lifetimes in this universe, it was not at all remarkable. It became known on Earth centuries later when it was blown immensely out of proportion because notes in my journals led to Matthew the Apostle. However, now the souls here and their personages can know about that lifetime because of my message, information that any of us transmits becomes part of our group knowledge and adds to the storehouse that is accessible to all in our lineages. But this doesn't mean that the Matthew lifetime itself has any more significance than before, the significance is that the truth of it now is available instead of only what is in the Bible. The effect is the same when the truth emerges about any souls whose lives have been misrepresented, those who have been unjustly maligned and those whose malicious deeds come to light. Telling you a bit about my personages other than Biblical Matthew will answer a number of readers' other questions. No. My combined lifetimes don't enable me to consciously or at soul level know every event and every person on earth or everything in your world's future. Like other souls here, I see the big picture, but none of us knows every detail about all the circumstances of every soul there. Only God knows, because He is all of them, and His knowledge grows continuously with every one of the limitless numbers of changes happening constantly. Nevertheless, we do have sources of information in addition to our lifetimes, and God is one. We observe the momentum of activity in Earth's energy field of potential. We communicate with persons in Nirvana who monitor the planet, souls at other stations like this, and members of advanced civilizations. And we can tap into the collective consciousness of Earth and the mass consciousness of the universe. Now then, as Archangel Michael's first personage in this universe, I was equipped, you could say, for birth into a spiritually evolved civilization, and the one chosen for me lives in an exquisite water world at the edge of the Milky Way farthest from you. A number of my personages lived on Earth during the past 100,000 or so years in your timing, but all prior lifetimes and many during those millennia were in Sirius, the Pleiades and other parts of this galaxy and others. Living in antiquity let me glimpse formative stages of Paradise Earth, then known as Terra or Shan, and to observe Gaia's stress during the eons that her planetary body was spiraling from its origin in fifth density and eventually became deeply mired in third. I saw the progressive effects of stronger civilizations altering the DNA of weaker civilizations downward to only two strands and I saw Earth's ancient populations miss astral alignment opportunities to ascend out of third density. Some of my personages lived on the planet during those long dark ages, and one was there when all life was lost as Gaia rid her body of negativity so it wouldn't perish. I know about those eras not only from the very narrow perspectives of my personages, but because that information is in the universal mass consciousness. You have the same information at soul level, and most likely it includes some, maybe many of your lifetimes. As one of the highest Universal Council's designers of the Master Plan for Earth's Golden Age, I could give you first-hand information about it and also tell you that because some souls reneged on their agreement to join the Light Forces, your society's progress was delayed by a decade. The Council knows the soul who was Gaia's choice to come to Earth and embody as Barack Obama, 
and because we have observed him throughout his years there, we know he has been unswerving in his dedication to serving the light and about his powerful foes within and beyond the government. Some of my other personages in influential positions, like heading federations that were assisting civilizations that wanted to ascend out of darkness, accomplished admirable objectives. Others fell short. Some personages were artisans, lawmakers, counselors, physicians, farmhands, administrators, musicians, merchants, teachers or traveling tradesmen with varying degrees of meaningful achievements. Others were in reconnaissance fleets, and the very few who were warriors necessitated quiet lives including some with severe mental limitation, to permit recovery of the cumulative psyche. I have experienced lifetimes of health and great longevity, joyful lives with beloved families, loyal friends, endeavors with distinction and prosperity as well as very short lives, imprisonment, impoverishment, illness, betrayal, failure, loneliness and isolation. In short, a vast variety of experiencing over a very, very long time, just as you have. How can I know that? Because you are reading this message. You are following your intuition to seek spiritual enlightenment and more self-discovery. Every personage is valued equally by cumulative souls, which don't measure any by wealth or power or fame, but by how closely free will choices adhere to choices in the soul contract. Regardless of where personages may be in this universe, their contracts are designed to balance cumulative experiencing because attaining the high vibrations within balance is the aim of every soul. All of us at this station are like you and every other soul, all of us are on our respective pathways toward our common destination, reintegration with God. And he has said, only when that occurs will he know what comes next. Our unconditional love and admiration for your light service to earth and soul selves is ever with you as you journey onward. Love and Peace Channeled by Suzanne Ward www.matthewbooks.com